a pleasure to introduce Jonathan, um, our second speaker, and I hope it won't embarrass him too much if I confess on the way over, as I was thinking about you know, how to introduce Jonathan, I, as I often do when talking to him or reading him or thinking about him, I found myself sort of slipping into some of his gestural <laughs> idiosyncrasies, I guess. Um, which I took to be sort of a mark of um, something about Jonathan as a colleague where, uh, I mean, aside from the fact that he's always, he's a great model to emulate, but in addition, um, he's somebody who, you know, when you're talking with him, you can always sort of feel Jonathan thinking with you, even um, in subjects that are outside of his already quite considerable realms of expertise. So, you know, the, no the notion of uh, collegiality sometimes is a word we use a lot. Um, but with Jonathan, it's a very tangible um, and very, I think, a very real performance, not just a performance, but a real uh, enactment of collegiality. So it's re really a, an honor for me to introduce him and something I've had a lot of occasions over the last couple years in particular to, uh, to experience. Um, the vital statistics uh, portion of the introduction. Um, Jonathan's the author of Affective Mapping, Melancholia and the Politics of Modernism um, from 2008, and the just published, just off the presses this year, uh, Like Andy Warhol from the University of Chicago Press. Um, and he's currently at work on a book from which his talk uh, this afternoon is drawn. Um, the book is called Black Leninism, How Revolutionary Counter Moods Are Made. Um, and that book, is a project on world-altering moments when new alliances, new enemies, new possibilities become uh, imaginable and tangible. It's a project that takes him to pre- and post-revolutionary Russia, interwar Germany, 1960s Detroit, um, and to the chapter he's going to prevent, present from today um, on Ralph Ellison's Black Leninism. So, welcome, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, th and whatever. Thanks for coming out. Uh, thank you, Walter. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Manny Center. Um, I sort of feel like, what would we, where would we be without you? Um, oh, we'd be <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So, uh, you know, apologies to uh, people who may have heard part of this uh, before. Um, and uh, th this is sort of a shortened version of a longer thing, and it bears some of the marks of that uh, cutting up. But um, you know, I'll be happy to uh, ramble on at length about any aspect of the talk. So, in periods of widely experienced political depression and frustration. It can be helpful to remember that otherwise discouraged people do sometimes come together in solidarity to form energetic, hopeful, and demanding collectives, which then engage in transformative political action. It's a thing that happens. I'd like also to say thank you to Jean uh, for her uh, spectacular talk that I, uh, and there's like a surprising number of resonances uh, between our uh, between our, our, our interests and our talks, which, um, which was nice to see, and sort of thinking about collectivity and community uh, reminded me of that. So, in the effort to understand how such revolutionary counter moods are awakened, the black radical tradition offers a formidable resource. From W.E.B. Du Bois to the Black Lives Matter movement, one can find a persistent preoccupation with the representation and creation of those moments when black people come together as a group for whom political action against the forces of white supremacy seems urgent and obvious. I understand these ways of feeling and knowing the world as counter moods, which is a term I borrow from Heidegger, because the oppositional we they create must be awakened out of what Gwendolyn Brooks calls the dry hours and the involuntary plan, the grade in humdrum of everyday life. 
For the residents of the kitchenette building that Brooks describes, it's hard to muster the attention to dream when preoccupied with onion fumes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall, and when the people from other apartments you might dream with are ahead of you in line for the bathroom. What matters at a given moment, in Brooks's poem, it's the thought of lukewarm water, now that number five is out of the bathroom and hoping to get in it. What matters in the way that it matters, the concerns that impinge or engage us in some way or another, these constitute a world in which one has been set. We can understand the setting, then, as this world of things that matter. As Heidegger has it, mood, or stimmung, also translated as attunement, is what orients us toward that world. It's our way of being in that world and with the others in it. In the most general sense for Heidegger, stimmung is the overall atmosphere or medium in or through which our thinking, doing, and acting occurs. It's a way of being with and being in the world that shapes our thoughts, our will, and our particular affective attachments to particular objects. Moods bring us to our there. They locate and orient us in our specific situated position in the world. As what shapes our apprehension of the world before cognition and volition, a mood directs our attention and makes it possible to care about something. In so doing, moods exert a broad but foundational form of judgment. Thus, the shifting attunements of moods constitute one basic way that, as Lauren Berlant puts it, bodies are continuously busy judging their environments and responding to the atmospheres in which they find themselves. Yet Stimmung is not merely personal, it's not a psychological phenomenon, it's not like an interior condition that reaches out to color the world. A mood comes neither from outside nor from inside, but arises out of being in the world as a way of such being. So even as we feel them on a subjective, emotional level, moods belong to a shared public world. They are, in essence, ways of being with. They are fundamentally collective. They arise from and also are the way that we encounter the historical situation into which we have been thrown or set. And we live in the moods that are already here in the world, that are shared by others and specific to our historical moment. It's difficult to occupy the mood today of the medieval nun. Um, try as we might. Um, uh, moods change and shift, sometimes imperceptibly, but we're always in some mood or another, even, uh, and perhaps most consequentially, when we don't notice it. But we can't just decide to be in a different mood. Uh, if only we could. The only way to exert agency in relation to our moods is by way of what Heidegger calls counter moods, as I mentioned. And if being with a mood brings being to its there, as Heidegger puts it, then a counter mood will bring a different there. A shift in the mood also changes the setting as a different set of concerns, objects, possibilities, emotions, friends, and enemies comes into view. It makes sense, then, that setting, this description of a world in which something happens, would be central to literary representations of moods or the making of counter-moods. And I want to examine here today one such effort from Ralph Olson's Invisible Man. So midway through the book, chapter 13, uh, we find a close, careful study of the transformation of an unhappy crowd watching the eviction of an elderly black couple into a powerful collective that halts the eviction. By way of the narrator's affective response to the couple's possessions piled on the Harlem sidewalk, objects that are full of black history and black feeling, the narrator, the invisible man, becomes attuned to the crowd that he has come to feel a part of and starts to feel like he can speak in a way that allows the we there to come into being. On the spot, he draws on his considerable experience as a speech maker to give an improvised speech, one that engages in a call and response with the couple and with the crowd. The speech comes to center on the collective shame the crowd feels for and with this old couple whose personal belongings are on the street for all to see. As a revolutionary counter mood is made, this newly formed we comes together in solidarity, shouting and laughing to bring these dispossessed objects back into the couple's apartment. So what else, this is like, just to give a sketch of like what the, you know, 
what the overall arc here is. And uh, my case is, or my interest here in this chapter, in this episode, is the way in which Ellison seems to be preparing for us a lesson in just how it happens that revolutionary counter moods are made. We see how the narrator's mood shifts in relation to the crowd and the objects on the sidewalk, and then how the narrator manages to move the crowd into a new way of being with each other and being in the world. So, I know that it is common to see Ellison's novel as an attack on the Communist Party of the United States, the CPUSA, as a kind of repudiation of his earlier communist sympathies. Um, and the CPUSA is, you know, is represented in the novel by um, uh, the Brotherhood. And it's this eviction, you know, this sort of eviction uh, where he stops the eviction is the scene where the, somebody from the Brotherhood like notices him and is, you know, and recruits him to be in the Brotherhood. So this sort of, this this inaugurates that sort of um, episode. So. While a critique of the, uh, of the Communist Party might also be presumed to be a critique of Lenin and Leninism, the eviction scene, which is written, which was sort of written or started at this moment when Ellison was uh, more sympathetic to communism, this eviction scene allows us to see that Ellison is also directly engaged with the Leninist tradition, and in particular the Lenin of what is to be done. There, as we all good readers of Lenin know, um, uh, Lenin argued that collective action was limited to spontaneous, unplanned uprisings when there's no collective with a sense of itself and its power as a collective whose members shared interests and goals. In order to create such a collective, uh, capable and ready for political action, it was necessary, if difficult, to represent that group to itself. And Lenin's famous, you know, uh, or notorious, depending on your political orientation, solution to this problem, uh, which Marx had represented as the transformation of the class in itself to the class for itself, was the Vanguard Party, which would engage in this ongoing work of representation through a variety of means, none more significant than the party newspaper. So, as Lenin presents it, the party newspaper works to move its readers from one way of feeling about one situation and the others with one in it, one characterized by passivity and a sense of isolation, to a feeling of urgency and the need to act against one's shared oppressors. And in this scene from The Invisible Man, we see the, narr we see the narrator do precisely this work of speaking for, speaking to, and speaking with a crowd in order to move it to a group that is for itself that's aware of its power and capable of action in its own interests. So the case is uh, that by attending to the scene with the Lenin of what is to be done in mind, it's possible to see the Invisible Man as a black Leninist critique of the Stalinist CPUSA precisely for failing to properly do this mood transforming work of representation rather than a critique of Lenin and Leninism as such. So the episode begins with the agitated narrator walking down a cold and snowy Harlem street where the biting air contrasts with his inner fever and where he's angered by racist ads for skin whitening cream. This alienated relation to his setting is interrupted when a thin spiral of smoke that drifted the odor of baking yams slowly to me, bringing a stab of swift nostalgia violently alters the narrator's sense of being in time and place. As if struck by a shot, the narrator is returned with full feeling to a forgotten past, as with Proust's famous involuntary memory uh, evoked by the Madeleine, this intrusion of a forgotten past that disrupts the fictitious progress of chronological time has the effect of making time seem as if it is, as Elson writes, endlessly expanded, stretching thin as the spiraling smoke beyond all recall. <clears throat> Yet, even as this past retreats beyond the call of voluntary memory, ol an old feeling recurs with its world <coughs> making intensity fully intact, and it is this sense fully present. I took a bite finding it as sweet and hot as any I'd ever had, and was overcome with such a surge of homesickness that I turned away to keep my control. So in this yam in which a vividly present memory world resides, the narrator is also connected to a specific collectivity. Others like him 
who also migrated to Harlem from the South and who also like yams. The senses, Marx might say, in finding and making social relations here are doing the work of theoreticians. The yam then changes his way of being in the world by plunging him back into a moment from his past and at the same time into the materiality of his present. These two things are in tension with each other. By way of contrast to the Jim Crow world of his childhood that the yam brings to life, being on the street in Harlem while eating the yam evokes an intense feeling of freedom because, as he writes, he no longer had to worry about who saw me or what was proper. He is freed from the feeling of being seen and judged by a white supremacist gaze that looks on, as Du Bois wrote, with the personal disrespect and mockery, the ridicule and systemic humiliation, the all-pervading desire to inculcate disdain for everything black from Toussaint to the devil. Instead of feeling the self-disparagement and self-questioning, as Du Bois put it, shared by a group of people, as he writes, who could be caused the greatest humiliation simply by confronting us with something we liked, the narrator embraces life on the yam level. This newly obvious commitment to liking without shame brings with it an avowal of the materiality and outsideness, outside oneselfness, such liking entails, and a new feeling of well nigh black nationalist group existence. For it is, after all, the blackness of Harlem as a collectively made and inhabited setting that dissolves his shame by making the white supremacist gaze phase from that world of things that matter as he eats the yam. So if by way of his encounter with the yam on the Harlem street, the narrator feels a new confidence about the blackness of his taste and an increased capacity for affecting and being affected by the world, this new openness is immediately challenged by his shocking encounter with the old couple's possessions on the sidewalk. His surprise at seeing things piled in a jumble on the sidewalk, surrounded by a sullen-faced crowd, quickly turns to embarrassment for the teary-eyed woman to whom these objects belong as he sees her being carried out of her house by two white men. Still, he is confused about what he is seeing. When somebody tells him they've been evicted, he's surprised. They can do that up here? He's never seen an eviction before. And when others at the crowd snicker at his disbelief, where did he come from? He feels embarrassed again. But this time the feeling is not for someone else's abjection, but for his own naivete. He doesn't know how to feel about this event that he finds himself in the middle of. The world has obtruded into his mood. On the yam level, he wasn't attuned to the possibility that they could do that up here. At such moments of feeling out of tune with the world, the partiality of any given mood can become painfully clear, as can the need to find another mode of attunement. Sometimes, such situations produce what Lauren Berlant has called genre flailing, casting about in different genres or ways of being in and making one's affective attachments in the world, each of which carries with, a, carries with it a set of expectations about the narrative shape a situation will take. The narrator here needs to improvise a new genre for this new unexpected setting. Having just, been, having just remembered being ashamed of what he likes, and then been embarrassed before the woman in her possessions on the sidewalk, and then embarrassed again at being the unknowing newcomer, his mood is attuned to the possibility of being ashamed, which is something he shares with the crowd. Indeed, it is in his experience of shame that they becomes we. They, we, were ashamed to witness the eviction, as though we were all unwilling intruders upon some shameful event, the narrator thinks. And then the shame of witnessing becomes a sense of being too ashamed to leave, since he was now too much a part of the crowd. As an affect that registers an interruption of positive interaction, interruption, what Silva Tompkins called the affect of indignity, of defeat, of transgression, and of alienation exists where an interesting or enjoyable relation has preceded it or been expected 
it thereby holds within it a powerful urge towards repairing the interruption and coming back together. The crowd's group shame brings with it a desire for collective transformation, to repair the injured relation with each other, with the old couple, and with the objects on the sidewalk. Moreover, shame gives the crowd a self-consciousness. It transforms the crowd from a sullen jumble into a group that is aware of itself as a group. At this point, they have plenty nerve, as someone says, to stop the eviction. All they need is a leader. And it's the narrator's turn back to this clutter of household objects on the sidewalk and his openness to the warm, rising, dark whirlpool of emotion that it draws up that enables him to speak with and for the crowd and become that leader. In a direct and sort of obvious, <coughs> like didactic, pedagogical echo of the experience with the yam, as he looks at the objects, which range from a portrait of the couple when young and a straightening comb to pots of green plants and the knocking bones used in blackface minstrel shows, he feels strange memories awakening as if his own past too resides <coughs> in his possessions. In a spilled drawer in the snow, he sees a newspaper story about Marcus Garvey's deportation, a greeting card saying, Grandma, I love you, and an old fragile paper that reads, Free papers, be it known to all men that my Negro primus provo has been freed by me this sixth day of August, 1859, signed John Samuels, Macon. This last sight leaves him reeling, dazed, again not knowing how to feel. The past to which the free papers belongs, when a white man could free his Negro, feels like a different epoch, discontinuous with the present. It's been longer than that, further removed in time, I told myself, and yet I knew that it hadn't been. Yet even as it seems removed in time, the white supremacist exertion of power evident in that then resonates with the now of the eviction. This combination of similarity and temporal discontinuity characterizes what Walter Benjamin has called a dialectical image, where what has been comes together in a flash with the now to form a constellation, one saturated with tension. In the free papers on the sidewalk, amidst the pile of belongings, the long historical struggle and the present crisis collide in a single image, one where the contradiction between freedom and its negation seems unsustainable, urgently needing some kind of response. This may be why the narrator finds that his hands are trembling, his breath rasping as if he had run a long distance or come upon a coiled snake in a busy street. That is, his out-of-breathness indicates at one and the same time his exhaustion from the length of the struggle and the urgency and danger of the moment. The narrator no longer occupies any kind of developmental or progressive temporality where one may achieve a better future through patient effort. Instead, return to his immediate material surroundings with the possibility of redeeming this spectral past right now the narrator is in now time, as if the entirety of black history has been directed towards this moment. The obdurate, vibrant materiality of the possessions on the sidewalk keep the narrator focused on the urgency of the situation because they place a collective past inside him, where, he writes, they cause discomfort far beyond their intrinsic meaning as objects. Like the speaker in Baudelaire's spleen, whose cavern-like brain feels like a crammed bureau or a pyramid filled with more anonymous deaths than a communal grave, the narrator finds that these possessions throbbed within him. Looking at the objects inwardly, outwardly, he finds the dark, far away and long ago, not so much of my own memory as of remembered words of linked verbal echoes, images, heard even when not listening at home. That is, what he remembers is a world of shared concerns and a way of being with others that has been distributed, that's been itself distributed in the objects of sensation that make up 
that world. By way of this odd inward-outward sensation of objects, which brings up memories that are not even his own, he becomes attuned to the crowd and starts to feel like he can speak with a collective voice. What has been forgotten is never something purely individual, Benjamin noted. It is a potter's field of anonymous shards of affect from the past. When we recover our own experiences in that field, their simultaneously singular and plural quality is disclosed. So as the shabby chairs, these heavy old-fashioned pressing irons, zinc wash tubs with dented bottoms pulse inside him with uncomfortably excessive meaning, the narrator is puzzled by his own intense memory of his mother hanging wash on a cold, windy day. In this way, the old couple's dispossession comes to feel like his. It was as though I was myself being dispossessed of some, of some painful yet precious thing which I could not bear to lose. But then precisely at this moment of intense personal memory found in the couple's objects like his mother's, his experience is mixed with the crowds become some, because some version of the same thing is happening to them. All of their own memories have been called up by these everyday objects of common concern, and they mingle there, outside themselves, on the sidewalk, in and among the things there. The objects thereby come to represent the crowd to itself. Although we all know what it's like to be recalled with sudden emotional force to a previous moment in time by a sensory object, one doesn't often hear collective political action discussed in terms of such a feeling. But here, in an apparent rejoinder, an extension of Lenin's What is to be Done, uh, and like Walter Benjamin, Ellison shows how collective revolutionary action bears the feel and the structure of involuntary memory, a surprising collective return to a past we didn't know we had forgotten by way of a sensory openness to the materiality of the setting. These simultaneously personal and collective memories reside not in individual heads, but in the material world where we have been set. So if he's found a way to be attuned to the crowd, it feels if he might be able to speak with a collective voice, he has yet at this point to find a genre for moving the crowd to action. And when he does begin to speak, in another challenge to ideas we may have about the revolutionary leader, it's not clear-headed conviction or sovereign decisiveness that moves him, but head-splitting ambivalence. As the confrontation escalates, he writes that he's pulled apart by the tension between his enthusiastic outrage which has been combined with a fear of what the sight of violence might reveal in me. But beneath all of these things, he writes, boiled up the shock-absorbing phrases I had learned all my life. It thus happens that we are a law-abiding people and a slow-to-anger people is his unlikely opening agitational salvo to the crowd. But the phrase is a familiar one, and people stop for a moment to listen, and they tell him what they think, and they kind of tease him about it, and a rhythm of call and response is developed. And we kind of see here how the making of a revolutionary counter mood, as Ellison lays it out, it's not, it's, 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 it's not instantaneous, but it's rather a kind of quick series of encounters, an assemblage of small transformations and little feedback loops uh, until the crowd uh, finds, with the narrator's help, a genre for feeling itself as a crowd that can act for itself, as itself. The narrator's speech involves a search for the ways, and here I'll sort of just try to give a sketch of the sort of elements of, uh, sort of what, he's, what he's doing in the speech. It involves a, a, a search for a way to distribute the sensible within a new genre, and as such, the speech above all involves a constant and ongoing process of representing the members of the crowd to themselves, to fold back the speech of its members into the effort to create this way of being attuned together. Thus, it is both improvisatory and it's characterized by a, this is my hand gestures, and a, uh, by, a, by, a, by, a, by an open-ended kind of call and response. So for instance, as he gets started, after he's absorbed the crowd's doubt about this notion of being law-abiding and slow to anger, he asks the old man how old he is. And the old man says 87 years old. And the narrator says, says, you, you, you got to yell that out loud so that your slow-to-anger brethren can hear you. 
87, he yells to the crowd, and the narrator immediately picks that up, saying, he's 87. 87, and look at all he's accumulated in 87 years, strewn in the snow like chicken guts. And we're a law-abiding, slow-to-anger bunch of folks who turn the other cheek every day in the week. What are we going to do? What would you? What would I? What would he have done? What is to be done? From this Leninist pivot, he moves gradually away from his initial caution, let's follow a leader, let's organize, he asserts. And as he, as he realizes that this law-abiding mood does not correspond to the encounter, he gradually begins to use the phrase ironically, sarcastically even, until the law comes to signify a mode of oppression and law-abiding a way of being with one another that is ridiculously self-punitive, absurdly accepting of injustice. Look at him, the narrator says, standing with his blue steel pistol and his blue serge suit. He's talking about the, so these two white guys, all we hear is like, all we know about these people who are doing the eviction is, uh, it's like two white guys who we think are maybe like, have just been like released from jail just to do the eviction, and what they call a marshal as a pistol. So he's talking about this. Look at him standing with his blue steel pistol and his blue serge suit. You see 10 for every one of us. 10 guns and 10 warm suits and 10 fat bellies and 10 million laws. Laws, that's what we call them down south. The effort to create a new way of being attuned here is aided by this twisting, this turning sarcastic of a recognizable way of feeling connected to a phrase, which is now shown to be inadequate, absurdly so, but is still collectively inhabitable in the ironic mode. They're still together and aware of their togetherness by way of this collective uh, feeling of sarcasm about being law-abiding and slow to anger. Similarly, throughout, he draws upon the old woman's attachment to her Bible, uh, which is threatened by the evictors and her desire to pray. At another key moment, he asks the old man what his job was. A day laborer is the answer. To which the narrator says, where did his labor go? Look at his old blues records and her pots of plants. They're down home folks and everything tossed out like junk world 87 years in a cyclone. 87 years and poof. He reminds the crowd that the provos look like his parents, look like his grandparents, they look like him, and that he's familiar with these objects. There are people, your people and mine, your parents and mine, what's happened to them? To which someone answers, hell, they've been dispossessed. The crowd at this point is eager to attack, but the narrator provides one last little bit of focus and a narrative path centering on the idea of being dispossessed and the shame of it. I'm running a little over, I've got like about four minutes. Okay. Um, the dispossession is not only theirs. It's not only the provost, it's common. It, both, it brings them together. Dispossessed, the narrator repeats several times. 87 years and dispossessed of what? They ain't got nothing, they can't get nothing, they never had nothing, so who was dispossessed? He continues, we're law abiding. So who's been dispossessed? Can it be us? These old ones are out in the snow, but we're here with them. They're facing a gun, and we're facing it with them. The plunge, then, into action comes at this moment when the narrator picks up the women's desire to go back and to pray with the Bible. Addressing the evictors, the narrator says, they don't want the world, only Jesus. They only want Jesus. Just 15 minutes of Jesus on the rug bare floor. How about it, Mr. Law? Do we get our 15 minutes worth of Jesus? You got the world. Can we have our Jesus? At this, the crowd gets ready to storm Mr. Law and his gun. And as they begin, the narrator urges them on. We are dispossessed, I say at the top of my voice. Dispossessed and we want to pray. Let's go in and pray. Let's have a big prayer meeting but we'll need some chairs to sit in. Lots of chairs. So let's bring the chairs in. And that's what sort of gets everyone carrying all the furniture then back into the place, right? To sort of under the rubric of um, going in for the prayer meeting. So if the narrator and the crowd come to see these possessions on the sidewalk as something that they are losing as well, that they have been losing, that they've already lost, they repair and redeem their own sense of collective dispossession by collectively repossessing them. These objects belong to us, the narrator asserts, 
This old man and woman are our people. Hide their shame, hide our shame, he shouts to the crowd, urging them on as they carry the objects back into the apartment. Among other things, Ellison is directing our attention to the importance of shame as what Eve Sedgwick memorably said was a near inexhaustible source of transformor, uh, a near inexhaustible source of transformational energy. The shameful dispossession negating sense of possession quickly extends outwards as a parade is excitedly proposed amidst the flurry of joyous activity. As one woman exclaims amidst the activity, it feels so good. The setting, a city space of sidewalks, streets, shop windows, funeral parlors, and offices which seemed previously closed off and alienating has become a zone of common concern, a shared world, newly meaningful and feelingful, where the narrator might walk in a group with that same feeling of intense freedom that characterized life on the yam level. Last paragraph. So when, to skip ahead, uh, in the famous closing lines of the book, as he announces that he's coming out of his hibernation, the narrator asks his readers, who knows but that on the lower frequencies I speak for you. He returns to the Leninist issues of collective representation raised in the eviction episode. Like the Leninist party that represents the members of the oppressed class to themselves, here the Invisible Man also offers to speak for a collective. But now it's a collective of his readers. Who is you here? Inasmuch as it includes his non-black readers, this for, who knows what that I speak for, this for might have another sense too. And it, from one point of view, it sounds like he's worrying, the narrator is, that he's been performing all along for a white audience, as at the beginning of the, uh, in, 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 at the, beginning of the novel at the Battle Royale, in a characteristic moment of double consciousness induced doubt. But I also hear, here, uh, a particularly black Leninism, one that suggests not some idea about the universality of the experiences of the um, Invisible Man, um, the sort of existential crisis that we all share, but um, rather, as C.L.R. James and Claudia Jones suggested, indeed as the common turn had suggested in the 1920s, and John Watson of the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement suggested here in Detroit in 1968, I hear the suggestion here that black people should be at the vanguard of the struggle for human liberation. But this speaking for happens on lower frequencies. <coughs> His disembodied voice coming on those long traveling radio waves. Like the blues, like Louis Armstrong, this voice speaks for what Langston Hughes called the low-down common element, and it operates through sound. It is improvisational and antiphonic. It thus travels well, farthest and lowest, on a medium like the radio, where it is in the air for you and me. The you he speaks of just has to turn the dial and tune in. For my, for my part, I feel like an Ellisonian black Leninism, improvisatory, antiphonic, openly sensory and aesthetic, attuned to the collective affective history embedded in the material world, an embedded history demanding reparation and redemption is exactly the Leninism that we need now. Thanks. Sorry for going over. Uh, happy to take. Uh, I mean, kind of 
superficially uh, equivalent scenarios, <coughs> with the distinction being that one was kind of improvisatory and the other was organized. Um, but but I'm thinking I was thinking about that in relation to this process that you were describing of kind of collective genre finding, which um, you know seems to me that it is like what Fred Moten is talking about when he talks about kind of the improvisatory ensemble. Um, you know where there's a where it's less a kind of universality and more a, a kind of a collective accompaniment. You know, with the absence of the, the the soloist is also a kind of accompaniment, and the, the uh, narrator who takes on the position of of, uh, of leading. You know, ostensibly leading the collectivity. And I guess I'm 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 interested in the way that you're thinking about this Black Leninism and how you how you understand that that process of representation in relation to kind of popular left understandings of Leninism in North America today uh, and the ways in which kind of that reading of Lenin I think often forecloses the possibility of improvisation because of the ways that it is conflated with a certain understanding of spontaneity. And so I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, uh, no, it's a great, um, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know if I have anything smarter to say than what, uh, than what you just said, um, but, I mean, in terms of the project, I mean, I mean, this is sort of, I mean, I just wrote that thing at the end, just like this morning or whatever, but, um, uh, whatever, I like black Leninism better than that Leninism, you know, <laughs> right, uh, than the Leninism of, like, Jacobin or whatever, you know, whoever you want to, you know. Um, no, I feel like Leninism has come to mean the things that the Brotherhood means in Invisible Man, like it's hierarchical, it's like a leader who like bosses you around, who like knows what to do, um, who, you know, and even Zizek kind of, um, you know, promotes this idea. It's like, you know, the, the Leninist is not, you know, afraid to make the tough decisions and like sort of risk the action at the decisive moment or whatever. And I feel like um, Allison's just, uh, I mean, I feel like this, this, I mean, if people know of other kind of, uh, of um, I mean, there are other moments, but I feel like this moment is a, is a really interesting one in that he's, and, and relatively unique, in that he's really just kind of on the very local level just sort of saying, like, how does it actually happen? that a crowd that sort of is not sure what to do and is just feeling kind of depressed and like ashamed, embarrassed, sort of individually withdrawn, sort of comes to actually, um, uh, you know, he moves to action, uh, which is what impresses the Brotherhood. He really moved him to action today, or, you know. Um, and I think the improvisatory is key, right? I mean, and I, I mean, the effect of, um, you know, I'm obviously thinking of Fred Moten's work, which is, whatever, bubbles through the whole thing, um, and his reading of Invisible Man and, um, in, in the break is sort of a condition of possibility for my own. But I feel like these are all sort of, yeah, yeah, I feel like it's improvisational and also this kind of the, answer, <coughs> the call and response, right? I mean, there's a way in which the, the I, mean, and I, I mean, for me, I feel like th this is also in Lenin, like the Lenin of like what is to be done, that sort of early Lenin that's, who's trying to figure out how to build a party, his whole thing is that the party is, the reason to have a party is it's just people who are devoted to the task, which is fairly, which requires listening, first of all, and being attuned to uh, what people are actually like worried about and freaked out about and stressed out about, and reflecting that back to people as a group, so that there's this sort of conversion that happens from a kind of individual singular sort of sense of anxiety or worry or dispossession or shame, and then it becomes collective by the mechanism of the party. But Lenin's sense of the party, in that sense, is fairly um, modest. There's no, they're not, they shouldn't be doing like ideological, you know, they don't need to be going and like explaining to people how fucked up capitalism or whatever. It's like people know already how fucked up it is. They don't need to be, you know. So the job is just to do this, in a way, fairly simple work of reflection, but that sort of manages to have a kind of shockingly um, transformative effect when it's uh, when it's accomplished. So, I mean, this you know. Anyway, so I mean, I'm trying to. I'm sort of looking at this tradition, but sort of trying to say that it it speaks quite directly to the political crises of the current moment in ways that um, I, 
I'm certainly not the only one to appreciate, or, or, uh, but I want to add my voice to the, um, and sort of uh, bring forth this sort of set of texts from the black radical tradition that I think really speak to the, to, the, to the current moment. And I feel like Black Lives Matter and movement for black lives and the way that people are looking back also to the Kambahi River Collective um, and their socialism and Audre Lorde's socialism. I mean, I feel like this is kind of, um, it's a very active moment for thinking about what socialism is and what black socialism, what socialism is and how that would work and how that would, anyway, so that's a long rambling answer to your question, but that's sort of just like my set of concerns um, about that. I don't know if John, John Pat, you had your thing. Oh yeah, um, I, I guess I just wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit on your reading that you did at the end of the last scene of the novel, um, since you had talked earlier about how you had, you had mentioned earlier the importance of setting, or as you put it, the material conditions in which people are set. Um, yes. And so I was curious if you had more to say in, um, along the lines you were talking about with the, lo the lowness of the frequencies, uh, with the lowness of and solitude of the setting in which he says that at the end, you mean being underground. That's sort of a vague and not really directed question, but I'm just sort of curious what you think about underground. And like I said, I just wrote that down. <laughs> so, uh, but thanks for the question. I mean, it's a good thing to, to, to think about. Um, I mean, especially given just the solitude of them. Yeah, right. He's underground. He's got all these like light bulbs or whatever, and there's like seven um, record players. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, and this is also in Moton's reading, I mean, the sort of the phonograph, the sort of, anyway, the sort of attention to the record, but but what I'm struck by here, I mean, in terms of thinking about the setting, um, is that it's it's a radio metaphor, right? I speak to you on, you know, who knows but that I speak for you on the lower frequencies. Um, and so it's interesting to think about the radio, what kind of a setting does the radio make, or whatever, or what kind of, um, what does it feel like to be on the radio? Be a, to be a radio voice, and I feel like in the sort of moment leading up to this, the narrator is sort of thinking about um, to be on the radio is to be, disembo is to be disembodied, um, and to sort of be in multiple places at the same time. Um, it's, you know, he talks about being a disembodied voice, and being multiple places at the same time, and I feel like that's also it's a, sh I mean, I think he's sort of trying to make a shift here from this sort of eviction setting to another kind of um, way of reaching a collectivity um, that sort of has a different kind of material. It, it's a whole other different kind of, uh, of setting and way of bringing the far near. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a, I mean, also it's like a communist trope. I mean, it's sort of like from the, t in the 20s and the 30s, um, like the radio was, a, you know, it was like a communist, that was how you were going to reach the masses. Um, and the early Soviets are sort of all fascinated with radio. Langston Hughes has, a, you know, the radio is sort of all in these sort of communist Hughes poems from the 30s. So um, that's not an answer to the question, but it seems like there's an interesting dialectic set up between this notion of, of, of speaking on the radio, speaking for other, speaking for you on the radio, um, on these low frequencies, and this sort of isolated, um, you know, it's sort of like this, you know, one is negating the other or something, right? It's, it's as if the, um, his hibernation that's preparing him for action, the sort of intensity of the isolation is then, a, a highly visible isolation, right? It's like all these light bulbs is kind of negated by this expansion outwards on the low frequencies. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. That's a good thing to, whatever. That's that's a good thought. Yeah, Barry, you're Yeah, um, I'm interested in teasing out what we mean to talk about Leninism uh, in an Americanist context, um, which I think is what you're doing. Um, I just spent a semester going through the history of the Soviet period and really looking at the revolution in relationship to the practical implementation of Leninism. And one of the differences that I would immediately draw from that would be uh, the sense that the party leads to the state. Uh, you know, it's the vanguard of the working class that actually leads to a state formation. So one of the questions is, like, what happens 
when you start looking at collectivity in relationship to an alighted term, I think, in your discussion, which is the state, which I think has to be identified with Leninism as such. And so then that kind of, that suggests that there's a kind of translation of the history of the Soviet, early Soviet period into the American context, one aspect of which is, you know, relates to black, uh, uh, working, the black working class in the formulation of a Negro socialist republic. And I'm sure you're aware of that. There was a kind of a Stalinist early 30s notion of a kind of nation that ought to be recognized in the way that nationalities would be recognized in the Soviet Union. Uh, and when you get into the popular front period, that notion of a Negro Soviet republic is dropped so that the specific national identity of Southern black people is suddenly absorbed into things like legal campaigns, the Scottsboro Boys, and you know a very different kind of politics. So what I'm interested in, in thinking about, like what's going on with the yam? Is the yam a national trope for a community of affiliation and memory? And is that national trope actually something that would never have been a part of the Leninist project because the Leninist project is distinctly anti-nationalist. Its entire politics were to look for a Soviet that's not specifically a national, a national body politic. And so I think in the tension then between the YAM as you know the sort of the memory trope that binds the community together and the ways in which Lenin is, a, is being evoked in the moment of what is to be done. There's, there's, quite a, there's quite a gap there, and I think it's a productive one, but it also might be a parodic one. It also might be one that's very much about you know, Leninism in translation. So I wonder if you could respond to that. I mean, the ways in which we've got a number of different kind of com ideas of community here, one of which would be a Leninist, one of the Soviet. Another would be a national community, and a third would be the kind of community that's like spontaneously organizing itself in relationship to the eviction. I guess that would be the practical example. Yeah, no, uh, thanks, that's really good. Um, uh, set of um, some problems to, th to, to uh, think through and, and, uh, and very generous. Um, uh, and thoughtful as a response. I mean, I guess I would say, um, I mean, in relation to the state, I feel like these questions are actually discontinuous, which is to say that, for Lenin, in his, in his sort of, in his own thinking, which is to say that the problem of thinking about how to form the Revolutionary Party <coughs> is of a different kind uh, than thinking about how to make the state. And you can kind of see this, um, Whatever you can just see it in his career, it's like once the revolution happens, he's like, "Oh shit, I gotta like a whole other set of practical problems produce are produced." And he like from 1894 to 1917, his thinking is really very consistent, and he's really just focused on sort of produce the, the proletariat is going to be the heroic force that leads the revolution, and we're just trying to figure out how to how, how do you make that happen. Everything is sort of organized around sort of doing the representational and agitational and organizational work to make that happen. After the revolution, I mean, not like he's not, you know, whatever, he writes State of Revolution, I mean, he's sort of thinking about the, um, about the state form, but I actually, I actually think that those are two um, different kinds of projects, which isn't to say that they're not related or whatever, but that they, but that they deserve to be con considered uh, separately, sort of conceptually or, um, uh, or theoretically. And I think that for the most part, the um, the Lenin that seems to be most attractive in the works that I'm interested in in this project is the Lenin of sort of collective formation, party formation, right? A, a revolutionary collective, right? Which is different than a collective that's going to like lead the nation or whatever, right? How do you bring people together? The problem is just how to bring people together into political action. Um, that's the sort of problem that the black radical tradition and how does the represent how do you do the work of representing a class to itself how do you do the work of representing a group to itself and what is it that happens when that when that uh, when that takes place and I, I mean I sort of whatever the, 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 I'm trying to make the case in the project that that, that there's a relatively um, coherent 
through line in African American cultural production in the 20th century that's preoccupied with this with, with this question of uh, representing a black collectivity to itself to enable a kind of the possibility of collective political uh, action and black people as a vanguard, so on and so forth. Those, those, so, those whole set of ideas. So that's the state. I mean, in terms of the nation, I mean, it's a it's. The relationship between nationalism and internationalism is sort of like paradoxical and vexed at this moment because, of course, the common turn um, in the 20s puts forward the policy of the Black Belt thesis, which is to say that black people in the United States constitute a nation, uh, an oppressed nation, a colonized nation, right? Which then, at first, all the black members of the Communist Party um, were like in Russia at the Congress at the time were like, this is totally. Um, this makes no sense. This is not how people. Um, but then, uh, but then they sort of uh, uh, accept it and sort of have to, um, you know, whatever. Otto Huiswood is there, and you know, sort of um, adapt themselves uh, at the Congress to this notion, and and then it becomes an interesting um, this notion of a nationality of an oppressed colony, which is then. I mean, the, so it's at once national, but then diasporically international. Right, so once you sort of are thinking about black people in the U.S. as an oppressed colony, they are then like other oppressed colonies around the world in the Caribbean and Africa, and so you get this paper edited by George Padmore and funded by the Common Turn, the Negro Worker, which is just filled with articles about, on the one hand, um, Jim Crow, and then on the other hand, South Africa, um, and then stuff going on in the um, in uh, in the Caribbean. So. Um, you know, I don't know if there's an easy sort of um, response to that uh, that problematic of nationalism and nationalism, except that I see them kind of completely interwoven in this case, which is also what what makes a black Leninism. You know, and I think black Leninism is diasporic and internationalist in this uh, in this way, but doesn't necessarily feel a tension between that and uh, or, or 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 the tension that's there is productive between that internationalism and nationalism? Can I just, uh, just a uh, clarifying question? I mean, do you think there's a difference between the ways that class solidarity happens in the party formation for Lenin, you know, in the forming of a working class conscious of itself, versus the way that solidarity happens around the memory traces with the collective objects like the Yam? And I think that's, that's like, you know, can they be brought together? Or they, I think they, they can. I think they can. I mean, I'm, I, 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 as the people who are here who are in my seminar, um, uh, where we just talked about this yesterday, um, I, I mean, I put a lot of weight in this. I mean, I'm not the only one, but uh, this sort of key passage in What Is To Be Done, where Lenin talks about the emotional force of reading um, what he calls exposures. Um, by which he means just like the newspaper reporting about fucked up stuff that happened to like that happened to you know some particular person, and his his argument is that that's the main thing that the Communist Party newspaper has to do is publish these exposures, which he says when you read these exposures, um, which are importantly specific, detailed, um, they produce an instantaneous. Lenin puts it uh, feeling of solidarity. Um, feeling italicized um, with these uh, with the people that you're reading about, and from that follows, Lenin says, um, knowledge of how to act. It sort of it brings a knowledge with it. That that sort of conversion. So, which is to say that for Lenin, it's a reading experience. It's an, it's an, a, a, a sort of sensorially and emotionally rich reading experience that does this work of producing solidarity. Um, on the local level, so I do see this. I, I, I do see a real connection, and you know, Dodge Revolutionary Union movement here. It's like they read, they read Lenin, um, and then that's when they start the newspaper featuring precisely these kinds of stories that are ex exposures, which then sort of organizes the factories. And so I feel like there's a there's definitely a connection in that along that line. Jonathan, you just have one. Oh, quick one. Boston, but uh, on the antiphonal and improvisatory, uh, improvis improvisational nature of the scene you described, yes. if you could, and I wouldn't ask this question except for this as a distinguished faculty fellowship lecture series, uh, can you talk about that in relation to what I think a lot of people in the room would describe as your own 
lyrical, orchestrated criticism. In other words, the talk finished, and I'm perfectly delighted because of the sheer power of the prose and the criticism of I've read it. Uh, hearing it is even sort of more um, uh, compelling because you're, you're, you're sort of putting me back like good old-fashioned literary criticism does into what Ellison himself does. Is that a contradiction or is it just my responding to a talk in the moment? Um, say what the contradiction is? The contradiction is you're such a good writer. Uh, and it's and it's so it, it's so compelling to listen to, uh, in in a very sort of traditional sense. It and yet, be, what you're should, it, should, it should be more unpleasant. Is that the, so? <laughs> well, well, it should be. Is it should be less lyr uh, It should be less lyrical, or less. I would see even uh, orchestral. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, you know. Uh, I just, I just have sympathy for the audience. Really. So, uh, I'm just trying to, um, you know, I just want people to like me. I um, but I don't, I mean, I feel like it's a, I, you know, yeah, I don't know, who knows? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. When writing about political agitation, should one, or whatever, to what, uh, to what extent should one adopt one's, uh, or adapt one's own mode of writing to, Thing that one's writing about. Yeah, yeah I, and again, it's, 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 it's just my uh, sort of immediate response was yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, how, uh, how pleasant it was <laughs> 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 to hear what you were doing. Yeah, 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 right. Thanks. Something, <laughs> you won't. It's, it's, uh, something to think about. <laughs> Thanks. I want to remind you that the closing date for the Arlene Williamson Endowed Distinguished Faculty Fellowship application is uh, February 23rd. Um, any senior uh, faculty member full time is uh, entitled to apply, and um, I encourage you to do so. If you're not, no, not motivated to do that, Recall that there is a, a faculty fellowship competition uh, going on. Uh, the theme is design, and um, it, the closing date for that is April 6th of this year. And so you might want to consider that as well. But immediately, I would hope you would join us uh, in congratulating these two wonderful uh, scholars from the English department, they, they, they entertained us, they, they made us think critically, interestingly, you can see the passion, and they didn't disappoint us, and the members of the advisory board of the Humanity Center were here. Uh, two others um, came in uh, after I, after I um, introduced them, the first one. Um, I didn't introduce Sydney. But I also want to let you know that Daniel Robert is here and Jose Rico Ferrer is here. And so you might want to talk to them about what are the things you need to, to emphasize if you apply for a fellowship. So please join us in the next room for uh, for a reception. And I thank you all for coming.